So this Bible study is open to everybody, which means I want respect. If you're Catholic and you're and someone else is a Protestant or you're Protestant and someone else is Catholic, don't argue doctrine back and forth with each other, please. Keep the comments respectful. I'm teaching this Bible study as an interdenominational, so another, I don't care what denomination you are. This is open to everybody. Thank you, Katie Khan, for the roses. If you are a non-Christian, if you're a Hindu, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jew, if you're an atheist, please be respectful to everyone in the comments. Christians, be respectful of non-Christians in the comments. We're all here to learn. Regardless of what your beliefs are, we're here to learn what the scriptures say. Whether you believe the scriptures or not, we're here to learn what they say. Magadanga B, how are you doing? Um, with that said, whenever I go, when we go through the scriptures here, you're allowed in the comments to discuss what you think they mean, but don't force what you think they mean onto other people. Thank you, John, for your comment. Hello, uh... Amarildo, Amarildo, is that what it says? Amarildo? Hello, Seraphic. I hear you, dog. <laughs> Satan's not a person, uh, Voodoo. Satan is not a person. Satan is a title. In fact, Jesus even called uh, Peter Satan at one point in time. Satan just means someone who's an adversary. That's all the word Satan means. Satan's name, though, is Samael. So the Satan is Samael. Good to hear. Glad to hear you're doing well, uh, Minas Freak. Nope, we just started, Seraphic. I'm just explaining the ground rules. Uh, so the ground rules, once again, are respect everybody. I don't care what your faith is. I don't care what your doctrine is. I don't care what your religion is or lack of religion. Have respect for everyone. If they disagree with what you say, allow them to disagree with you. Who cares that they disagree with you? We're here to learn. Nope, this is the same channel I've had, John. Same channel I have had. All right, there you go, Caden. One's down, everybody. How do I know Satan's name? Well, first of all, the KJB translated... Go on, Caden. Translated... Uh, incorrectly translated something from the Latin Vulgate, and the Latin, Latin Vulgate incorrectly translated it, that's why the KGB has the incorrect translation. Lucifer is not the Satan's name. We get the Satan's name from like the Book of Enoch and other sources that are like uh, Jewish apocryphal writings. And if you didn't know, apocryphal writings, they're not scriptural, but they're still valuable for learning from. So it doesn't mean you take the apocryphal writings, if the apocryphal writing says something and disagrees with scripture, reject that teaching in the apocryphal writings. But the apocryphal writings have uh, valuable information. In some of the Jewish apocryphal writings, we learn that the Satan's name is Samael. The book of Enoch uh, is in the Ethiopian canon of the Bible. It is not in, uh, so it's not in the, the Orthodox canon. It's not in the, the Roman Catholic canon. It's not in the Protestant canon. It's not in the Jewish canon. Um, but it's apocryphal, except for the Ethiopian church treats it as scripture. All the others treat it as apocryphal. Yep, John 3, 6 seems a good one. Now, while I'm doing this, I'm not going to be able to read comments exactly the same way I do when I'm running my other lives. Kind of like when I'm doing my, uh, my karate live, you know, when I'm teaching karate. I, I'm teaching, I can't read all the comments, so please bear with me because I can't read all the comments while we're doing this. Also, we're going to open with prayer, and we're going to start with the Lord's Prayer here, but we're going to work our way through it. Um, so as we pray here, and the reason why I want you to work our way through it is a lot of people, you get through it, and they, they say like the Lord's Prayer. Now, the uh, Catholics will call it the Our, the Our Father Prayer, but the Our Father and the Lord's Prayer is the same prayer. Whenever you... Uh, Whenever you go through these prayers, after a while, you, might go, if you just recite the words, it, it loses all its meaning. You need to sit there and try and meditate on these prayers as you go through them and understand what they mean. So we're going to start with the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to do another prayer, understand what they mean. And the, the second prayer we're going to do is my personal prayer before uh, reading Scripture. And then we'll get into the Scripture. Today's Scripture we're going to go over is Acts 10 and 11. Now we may not get all the way through Acts 11 before the end of this live here. Uh, doing good, Pramila. How you doing? 
So I may not get through all of Acts 10 and 11. If not, next Sunday we'll continue with Acts 10 and 11. But let's get through these prayers first before we get into Acts 10 and 11. So the first, like I said, the first prayer is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now before we continue the prayer, let's think about what does this actually mean? Why does it start with our Father? Our Father, it's starting with that because what we are is we're adopted children of God. Adam and Eve were children's were children of God. They were children of God. Then they fell from grace, and they were no longer children of God. Which means all of their offspring were born with that original sin. Therefore, all of their offspring were no longer children of God. Creations of God, yes. Children of God, no. Yeah, I know that uh, the Bible is just a book, but you know what else? My biology textbook that I learned Biology 101 from was also just a book. Uh, but anyhow, books contain information. They're very, very valuable. That's why when like the library in Alexandria burned to the ground, that was a tragic loss for all of humanity. Uh, but anyhow, books are important. It doesn't matter what's in them. Um, so anyhow, when Jesus uh, died on the cross, he paid the price for the initial sin that Adam and Eve gave, plus all other sin that everyone else would commit, did commit, or will commit in the future. All sins were covered by the blood of Christ, allowing us to be adopted back into God's family, making us adopted children of God, getting rid of the blemish that Adam and Eve gave us. That's why we say our Father, because we're adopted back into being children of God. Next, who art in heaven? We have to acknowledge that God the Father is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. In other words, his name is holy, his name is sacred, and so we want to keep that holy and sacred. Now, an interesting thing to note, we don't say his name in the New Testament. His name was used in the Old Testament, but his name is not transferred into the New Testament. It is replaced with Father rather than Yahweh or any of the other names of God. All right, well, I'm going to... I don't mind people uh, learning here, but when we get people who don't know what they're talking about, we're going to get rid of those people. I want people to learn and want people to learn, but if they're going to sit here and try to inject stuff that they don't know what they're talking about, and they're going to constantly inject it, you will get blocked from this live. So if you want to learn and study with us, please be respectful. But like this uh, Faku, it's me, or whatever his name is, he didn't want to sit there and uh, he doesn't want to learn. He wants to preach, and so he's gone. Like I said, I don't want any preaching on here. I want us to explore what this stuff means. Good morning, Pink. How you doing? All right, so the next part of the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. The reason why we want thy kingdom to come. We are all, as Christians, we're of a single kingdom. Now, in the medieval times, the church came up with the term Christendom. You may not have heard the term Christendom before. You may have heard, no, I know you've all heard Christianity, but you may, may not have heard the term Christendom. <clears throat> this is going to bring up the word Catholic. Why did the word Catholic come about? Well, in Christ, we're supposed to be one people, one nation, one creed. We're supposed to be one people, one kingdom under God. And as time goes on, you know, you got, well, you got Christians in this country, Christians in that country, Christians in this denomination, Christians in that denomination. And there's fracture and division. And there's not supposed to be fracture or division in Christianity. And this is one reason why Ignatius of Antioch came up with the term Catholic or Catholicism, because that means universal. It's supposed to indicate that we're all supposed to be one in Christ, not separate entities, you know, who cares if you're Baptist? Who cares if you're Catholic? Who cares if you're Orthodox? Who, who, who cares if you're this denomination or that denomination? We're all supposed to be Christians. And so Ignatius of Antioch, and as far as I know, that's the earliest in writing of the word Catholic is in one of uh, Ignatius, Ignatius of Antioch's letters. Is That's the first place where the term Catholic appears. And so Ignatius of Antioch came up with that term to indicate that we're supposed to be unified in Christ Jesus. Uh, also, then later on, the word term Christendom came out to further in, uh, identify that because in Europe at the time, you would have, you know, 
the Germans, the French, the Italian, you know, all these different European countries all go, well, yeah, we're all Christians, but I, I know I'm French before I'm a Christian. I'm German before I'm a Christian. And so the church came with the concept of Christendom to say we're all, you may be French, but you're a Christian before you're French, rather than French before you're a Christian. And so they came up with the term Christendom to try and unify people even more. And that also had to do with the Crusades. Because with fighting the Crusades, they didn't want, oh, Germans, you do what you do, French do, you know. They wanted all the countries of Europe united into one to go fight the Crusades. All right, next part of the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. So in other words, thy will be done, that should be pretty obvious as to why you want his will to be done. Because if God's will is done, then you have justice, you have peace, you have love, you have all those things that we desire, rather than all the evils and sins and all that other stuff in the world. And it says, on earth as it is in heaven. This is important because in heaven, God's will is perfectly done every day. God's will is never violated in heaven. It's only violated here on earth. So in other words, we want God's the how God reigns in heaven and how heaven is. We want heaven on earth, basically. Give us this day our daily bread. All right, so this daily bread part. What is our daily bread? Well, whenever Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, what did uh, what did Samael, a.k.a. Satan, tell Jesus to do? Jesus had been fasting, what, 40 days, I think it was? And so he was hungry. Now, he said, it's written that he can take these stones and command them to become bread, then he can take and eat. And what did Jesus respond? He said, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Father. So this daily bread is our word from God every single day. It's what God wants to teach us for that day. It's how God wants to direct us for that day. It's how God wants to discipline us for this for the day. And mind you, discipline doesn't just mean punishment. Discipline also means making you a good Christian every day. So praying to get your daily bread is to have God teach you so that you can become a better Christian every day and become more Christ-like every day. Thank you, uh, Michael, for the hearts. All right, going on from there, then it says, now here I use the words wrongdoings. Different versions of the Bible translate this differently. If we have, uh, forgive us this day our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. There's lots of different ways that it's worded depending on the translation. For my personal use, I just say wrongdoings. So I say, and forgive us our wrongdoings as we have forgiven those who have wronged us. This is important because what did Jesus say is a qualifier to have your sins forgiven? Now, asking for forgiveness is all you need to do, but there's a qualifier to that. And Jesus said that you have to forgive the sins of others. And he gives lots of parables on that. Like one of the parables he gives, uh, there's uh, someone who has a great debt to the king and the king says, okay, I forgive your debt. Then the guy goes out to all the people who owed him money and went around trying to collect the debt from all the people who owed, owed him money. And then the king heard that he was doing that and said, whoa, 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 I forgave you all this and you can't forgive those who still owe you? And then threw the guy into prison. That was a parable, Jesus said, saying exactly that. Jesus saying, if I forgive you your sins, you need to go forgive the sins of those who have wronged you. Uh, you're not too late, Easy. We're going through the Lord's Prayer right now and breaking it down so we understand what we're saying when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Uh, R.A., your question, was it not Christians that was... Uh, R.A., so the apostles and Jesus were Jews, not Christians. Christianity did not exist yet. So uh, going through the history of the term there to answer your question real quick. Uh, so at the time, Jesus was a Jew. He was an Israelite. All the apostles were Jews and Israelites. After at Calvary, uh, thank you, Pink, for the uh, was that a love? Thank you for the love, you. God bless you. At Calvary, whenever Jesus died on the cross, something important happened on the cross right there. If you read, it says the curtain tore. So if you go into the Jewish temple, there's the place where you can pray to God, but then there's something called the Holy of Holies. Thank you, Pink, for the roses. The Holy of Holies is where, like, the Ark of the Covenant would have been kept. That's where the Holy Spirit of God resided, was in the Holy of Holies. And once a year, a priest would go in into the Holy of Holies to perform his duties, 
and it had to be a priest chosen. He had to make sure he was like ultra pure, and all these sacrifices had to be done because the the priest had a single blemish on him, he would die. And in the Old Testament, right, they would tie a cord around the priest. And if he went to the Holy Holies and he died while he was in, they had to use that cord to pull him back out of the Holy Holies. An important thing happened at the moment Christ died on the cross. And you can read about it, and it says that the curtain between the Holy of Holies tore in two. And there was a voice heard that said, let us leave this place. Let us leave this place. It didn't say, let me leave this place. Let us leave this place. So there's people say that there's no Trinity in the Bible. Yes, the word Trinity is not mentioned. But why would God say, let us leave this place? Was he referring to the fact that he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Or was he referring to the, you know, like the royal we, like, you know, like a king speaking, saying like, well, we did this, but the king is really saying he did it, but he's using the word we instead. So was God using a, a royal us there, or was he referring to the fact that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all in one? But anyhow, the Holy of Holies was vacated by God at the moment Christ died on Calvary. Then what happened about a couple months after that, Pentecost happened. And then the Holy Spirit entered into the believers. So God originally used the Jewish temple as his, you know, the temple in Jerusalem as the place he would reside here on earth for people to come to, moved out of them, and then we as Christians became the temple. At that point in time, there became a division between Christianity and Judaism at that point in time. Christians were still not called Christians at Pentecost, but they started to become, a, they, the Jews referred to them as a cult because they were different than mainstream Judaism. They were a different type of Judaism is what they were. Later on, uh, they started referring to themselves as followers of the way because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So the believers started calling themselves the way, the way of Jesus, the way of truth, the way of life, the way to the Father because Jesus is the way. Later on in Antioch, um, this is where the followers of the way or the believers in Jesus first became called Christians was at Antioch. And there's reasons for that as to why they first got called Christians at Antioch, but that's a very controversial subject, and we'll talk about that in a different study if you want to uh, understand possibly why. They're not saying this is why, but possibly why they first were called Christians at Antioch. But that's the first time you see the word Christian being used is at Antioch. So I hope that helps answer your question there, R.A. Let me get caught up on comments here. That's awesome, awesome Hisbo. I'm glad you read Matthew 18. Morning, Sherry. I'm glad you're enjoying, John. Morning, Nicole. Yeah, only from the house of Aaron could they enter the Holy Holies. That is correct. All right, let me get caught up on comments here. Uh, I only te I'm only doing the Bible study one night a week. This is the very first Bible study I'm doing on TikTok. And then uh, we will... I do do morning lives, but the morning lives are my life in the Philippines here. Okay. So let's get on to the next part. So we're still going through the Lord's Prayer here. We just got done with... All right. Forgive those who wrong you. So we just talked about the importance of... Uh, forgiving those who have wronged you. And I, I don't care what sin they've committed. You should forgive them. That doesn't mean you need to trust them after they've sinned against you, but you need to at least forgive them. Good morning, Trina. How you doing? Yes, Jesus did make it to where everyone's sins can be forgiven. The important distinction, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross forgave the sins of the past, the present, and the future. So people ask, well, how, how did Abraham get saved if Jesus hadn't, hadn't died on the cross yet? Abraham believed in the coming Christ back then. So Abraham believed in Jesus before he knew who Jesus was. Therefore, his sins were covered by the blood of Christ when Christ uh, died on the cross at Calvary. All right, so the next part of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So right here... Temptation and sin are two different things. Just because you're tempted does not mean you've sinned yet. Thank you, Pink, for the roses. So, temptation and sin are different. If I cannot be tempted, then the likelihood sin will occur is 
very rare. It's, it's not really going to happen. So if you can remove temptations from your life, the likelihood you're going to sin becomes very, very small, very, very quickly. And then lead us from evil. So deliver us from evil is not just about, uh, not just delivering us from sin, but delivering us from evil people. What does, what does Jesus teach? Um, I had a prosperity gospel preacher pop up in my inbox two days ago. And it's hilarious. He's telling me how Jesus wants me to be rich and wealthy and have all this money and stuff. But that's absolutely what Jesus did not teach. Good morning, uh, good morning, uh, BL Asian, Kali Mixed, uh, Shadi, how you doing? Thank you, Lorraine. I appreciate your comment. Exactly. Just, lust is not sin either. Lust leads to sin. Uh, what is it? I think it's Book of James. I have to have to double check. I think it's James. Maybe it's Jude. It's one of those two. But they go through and they talk about uh, lust leads to temptation. Temptation leads to sin. See, they'll, there's all these things that are, you know, just because like you know, if I see like, okay, look, I'm, I'm a dude. So let's say I see this really attractive woman rocking. Go, whoa, like that. But they go, okay, that's it. That that lust got me for a moment. Like, no, no, no. I did not sin just because I had lust. Lust leads to sin. Hello, Lorna. No, this is the first Bible study, Lorna, right now. So this is the first time I've been on at this time slot right now. Okay, so anyhow, um, but Jesus said we'll be persecuted, ridiculed, made fun of, you know, people say false things about us for serving Jesus, for following Jesus. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. In other words, being a Christian means you're going to be persecuted, ridiculed, some people have been tortured and killed for being a Christian. And Jesus said, that's going to happen to you. Now, not everyone gets tortured, not everyone gets killed, but you're probably going to be persecuted for being a Christian. Um, and so when it says deliver us from evil, it's to protect us from those things. Because the world's going to come as hard, it's asking God, please protect me from what the world's going to try to do for me, do to me. Alright, then the last part says, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. So in other words, we're basically saying that we acknowledge you're my king forever and ever. Um, you're acknowledging that he is the only power in the universe that matters, and you're acknowledging that he deserves all the glory. I mean, after all, he created everything. Our creator deserves all the glory we can give him. And so we're just acknowledging that. At the end of the Lord's Prayer, the very last part is Amen. Yeah, it's St. Dieter, I know. I know. We all get it. Love and blessings back to you. Phenomenal purpose. So anyhow, um, that's the Lord's Prayer. It ends with the term Amen. Amen is a Hebrew word that means so be it or may it come true. So at the very end of the Lord's Prayer, we say so be it, may it come true, however you want to interpret Amen to mean. Now be careful, there's a false teaching out there that says Amen comes from Amun, as in Amun-Ra, the Egyptian god. And that's just utter, total garbage. That is not what Amen means. Amen is a Hebrew word that means so be it. And that is the Lord's Prayer. So when we start these Bible studies, we are going to say the Lord's Prayer. But as we do it, I don't want to have to explain it again. I will if I have to. But I want you to think as we go. I'm not going to say to go, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. I'm not going to blast through it. We're going to go slow. So let's do the Lord's Prayer at the, at the speed I'm going to do it during these Bible studies. And we're going to go slow enough so you can think about what each and every single part means before we move forward. Now I don't mean you deep thought, but you need to be able to think about what, is, what am I saying here when I'm saying this? So that it's in your heart too, not just something going through your mind and out your mouth. Alright, so let's do the Lord's Prayer at the speed we'll do it in the Bible study. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our wrongdoings, as we forgive those who wronged us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So you notice how I put a pause in there between each point you should be thinking about in your heart? I pause at each point so that you can sit there and think in your heart. Here, too, but think in your heart as well about each part in that prayer so that it has meaning every single time you say it. 
Good morning, spiritual journey. Uh, Katie kind of lost context on what you're saying there. That's good to hear, Seraphic. Oh, well, amen meant truth. Uh, go, uh, go look up the word amen, uh, Hebrew. Go look up the original Hebrew word. It, it literally does mean so be it. All right, let's get into the next part. Uh, okay, I'll address your point real quick. R.A., what do I think of Buddhism? Buddhism is kind of a strange thing. Buddhism is like a philosophy more than it is a religion. Uh, Buddhists can believe in whatever God they want. Buddhists don't care what God. You could be an atheist and be a Buddhist. You can believe in any God you want, you'd be a Buddhist. You can be monotheistic and be a Buddhist. You can be polytheistic and be a Buddhist. Buddhism doesn't care. Buddhism is more like a philosophy than it is a religion. And that's confusing because Christians think it's a religion, you know, where you're serving, where you're worshiping Buddha. And whereas some Buddhists do worship Buddha, not all Buddhists worship Buddha. Some Buddhists just follow Buddhist philosophy and that's it. So Buddhism is, is kind of a different, different beast. You can have Buddhism and it's just be a philosophy. You can have Buddhism and it can be a religion. So it's, it's all these different things at once but not one Buddhist is doing all the things at once. I hope that makes sense, R.A. Uh, you mean uh, Lynette go through the Lord's Prayer again? If I get it, if I might, we might break it down again. Awesome, Seraphic. But exactly, uh, exactly, Anna Marie, sort of like that. Uh, it has to do with enlightenment, though, about growing yourself. I do know a little bit about Buddhism. It's about growing yourself. It's about eventually cultivating your yourself so that you can escape the cycles of reincarnation, basically. Very true, Tenderheart. Thank you, Jiggly Monster, for the heart me, and uh, how you doing today? Oh, yes, uh, I'm going to do these every Sunday in this time slot right here. All right, so how you doing, Jiggly Monster? Okay, going down here to the next one. This is the next prayer we're going to do. And this is the one that we'll do before reading the scriptures. And this is a prayer. This is my personal prayer. I wrote this one. Uh, thank you, Katie Khan. We'll just go through the prayer real quick, and then we'll break it down like we did the, the, the Lord's Prayer. So this one says, Father God, send upon us the Holy Spirit so that our ears can hear, our minds deduce, and our hearts understand the teachings in your Holy Scriptures. Amen. Simple little prayer like that. So let's break that one down. Father God, we're acknowledging that we're talking to God the Father. Why? There's some churches that go, they start, Jesus. They would say the same prayer, Jesus, send upon us the Holy Spirit. Uh, the reason why I always start my prayers addressing the Father is because Jesus in the Lord's Prayer said, this is how you pray, our Father. He's, Jesus started the prayer with, by praying directly to the Father. Now, some of the apostles prayed directly to Jesus, as you'll see in the book of Acts. But, it, whereas you can pray directly to Jesus, because, well, Jesus is God according to uh, certain denominations. Uh, Jesus instructed us to pray to the Father. So I always pray to the Father, in, usually in my prayers, in Jesus' name. This one I don't end in Jesus' name. It's a real quick one to give us understanding that at the end of the Scripture reading, then we I close it up with a different prayer. And send upon us the Holy Spirit. Well, what is the Holy Spirit? There's another name for the Holy Spirit, and that is Counselor. The Holy Spirit is also known as the Counselor, or the Great Counselor. Why does he have that name also? The reason for it is because the Holy Spirit teaches us. So if we let the Holy Spirit teach us, yes, the Holy Spirit resides in the hearts of the believers, but the Holy Spirit also teaches us. So asking the Father to send upon us the Holy Spirit is asking God to have the Holy Spirit teach us as we're reading the Scriptures. Next part, so that our ears can hear. Uh, easy. Jesus is the Son of God and God at the same time. I will explain that um, explain that in a minute here. Uh, let me get through this prayer here easy, and I'll, I'll explain that here. And I'll give you different different modes of thought on that. Yes, that also, Anna Marie, he's also the counselor. He's also called, uh, uh, I think the other one's titles is wonderful as well, uh, in the book of Isaiah. 
uh, sent upon the Holy Spirit so that our ears can hear. Well, what we're asking for is for our spiritual ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Uh, so our minds can deduce. Deduce means to come to logical conclusions. Basically, to critically think about something and come to the proper logical conclusions. We don't want to read the scriptures and just go like, not understand what we're reading. We want everything to make sense. And so that's what that part's about. And our hearts can understand. Well, in the ancient world, your thought processes just weren't contained up here. The ancients thought of your thought process occurring here and here. And so we want our heart, not the actual valve that pumps, but we're talking about, you know, uh, your ability to understand being here in the heart so that I can then use it appropriately. Oh, that's not good, Jiggly Monster. Well, hopefully, hopefully the smell, well, if it's been sitting idle for a few days, you might have dust mites that moved in on it and the, the dust mites are burning off. As soon as they burn off, the smell will go away, Jiggly Monster. Yes, sir. If it will, let me finish this prayer here, and we'll explain that. And then we'll start our scripture. Well, Jiggly Monster, if it's make sure what it is, it might just be dust mites burning off. So you might have. How long was your furnace off, Jiggly Monster? If it was off for like several days, it might just be dust mites burning off. Um, and then finally, and our hearts understand the teachings in your holy scriptures. So it's just a simple prayer asking God to help us understand what we're about to read. All right, so let's talk about Jesus here. Try to answer your question there, easy. There are different different modes of thought. I'm not going to tell you how to think. I'm just going to give you what the scriptures say, and then you can make your own decision about it. But ask the Holy Spirit to help teach you. So, Jesus is the Son of God. But the way most churches teach that God exists in three states. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the three states that God exists in. But they all exist as one. So three three states existing as one. Yes, the Holy Spirit is our teacher, Anna Marie. I'm sorry, Melissa, but you're, you're catching this now. That's good. Day three, okay, Jiggly Monster might very well be dust mites burning off. Um, if it's daytime right now, turn your heat on, Jiggly Monster. See if you can go outside. Go, go grab a cup of coffee, be gone for a couple of hours, and then see if the smell is gone when you come back. That's one method. At three days being turned off, it's probably dust mites. Uh, but don't don't take my word for it. I'm just giving you a suggestion. It might be dust mites. Now make sure it's not like propane smell. If it's a smell of, uh, if it's a smell of propane, then there's a problem. You need to get that fixed. Okay, so anyhow, God exists in three states as one. And we've got to remember, what God is, om is omnipotent, right? means he's all powerful he's omniscient which means he uh, knows everything and he's omnipotent or uh, omnipresent meaning he's everywhere at once so no matter where the father is the son is or the holy spirit is they're all three together always they're inseparable so there are, people say there's nothing impossible for god there are a few things that actually are impossible for god for example the father and the son and the holy spirit cannot separate themselves from one another they're always together you cannot separate the one from the other. They're always together. It's impossible for them to be completely separate from one another. Uh, Jiggly Monster, propane has no odor, but they put an odorant in there. It smells like rotten eggs. So it has kind of like a rotten egg-like odor. Then that would be a, a leak in your line. Yeah, exactly, R.A. Uh, yeah, make sure you don't have any carbon monoxide coming off of your furnace as well. So hopefully you have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. Kind of like body, soul, and spirit, but different, Anna Marie. Different from that. It's it's beyond human comprehension. But anyhow, if you read in John, John says, In the beginning God created the heaven, or, sorry, that's Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And as you go through John, it eventually says, And the Word became flesh. And then as it goes through, eventually you see that the word that became flesh is Jesus. So Jesus is in John 1.1. 1, 1. So we can read John 1.1 1, 1 a different way. We can say, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. So right there we have a declaration directly by the Apostle John that Jesus is God. 
Now, what's the importance of Jesus being God the Son? Well, Jesus is also called the begotten uh, Son of God. Well, what does begotten mean? It, it means he wasn't birthed through normal processes, that he was, um, how to explain begotten? Uh, so in other words, he was like willed into, willed to be by the Father. And that, that does not mean that he was willed to be in spirit. He already exists in spirit. His body was willed into existence. So in other words, the human nature of Jesus was begotten while the spiritual nature of Jesus existed forever because the spiritual nature of Jesus is divine and is God. Yes, exactly, Anna Marie. It's a, it's a mystery, uh, but trying to get people to understand. It, people have been struggling with that mystery forever and ever. The most important things to memorize is that Jesus is God. And let's try to think of it this way. So God is spirit. As God is spirit, you cannot see a spirit. You cannot hear a spirit. You cannot feel a spirit. Okay, There's no way to detect a spirit with your physical senses. So what is Jesus? Jesus, as it's written in Hebrews, is the image of the invisible God. We are doing a Bible study, Raymond, so this right here is a Bible study. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So in other words, for Jesus or for God the Father to be able to speak to us, Jesus is his mouth. So we can hear his words with our physical ears through the physical mouth of Jesus. So Jesus himself says he can't, he can't do anything. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. So in other words, every action Jesus does is what the Father wants him to do. Because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Uh, Katie, they try to debate the Holy Trinity because they believe that Allah is just the Father. That's it. They they don't see Allah as being the Son and the Holy Spirit. They just see Allah as just the Father, and that's it. And that Jesus was just a prophet. So they have to debate the Holy Trinity because it's in stark contrast to what Islamic teachings are. Uh, so anyhow, since Jesus is the image of the invisible God, we now need to take a look at the next part. So we now know that Jesus is the mouthpiece of the Father. We know that Jesus is the ears of the Father, the eyes of the Father, to look at, because what, what happened? Philip said, please show us the Father. And Jesus, Jesus said, Philip, don't you know if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. But who is Jesus' spirit? Jesus' spirit is the Holy Spirit. We see this, uh, some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law started saying that Jesus had an evil spirit. After Jesus heard them saying that he had an evil spirit, Jesus said that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an unforgivable sin, and it will not be forgiven in this life or the next. So in other words, when they were insulting the Holy Spirit, they were or saying that Jesus had an unclean spirit, they were directly insulting the Holy Spirit, which means that the spirit of, of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And so that's the three parts. The Son is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the Father, and His Spirit is the Holy Spirit. So all three parts are right there in Jesus, and I just and that's all scriptural right there to say all three parts are in Jesus right there. So when you think of Jesus being the Son of God, think of it this way: My son Caden. My son, Caden, is an image of me. He's an image of Kimberly, too, but he's also an image of me. Correct? He's going to have features that look like me. He's kind of an image of me. Isn't he? Is, isn't, isn't Jesus, or not Jesus, isn't Caden sort of an image of me? Thank you, James, for the, the hearts. So since Caden is like an image of me, and I'm his father, right? Caden is my son. He's sort of an image of me. When we use the father-son relation with, with, with God, God the Father created an image of himself, the human Jesus. The human Jesus became an image of God the Father, and that is the Son there. The Son, though, is not created. Just the human flesh is created. The spiritual part of the Son is eternal with God the Father. 
But the flesh of Jesus was created, conceived in the womb of Mary, virgin conception, a virgin birth. And that image, this flesh, this man we call Jesus, is the image of the Father, inhabited by the Holy Spirit, being the Son of God, the Word of God. Does that make sense? Does that make sense easy? Does that make sense as to how Jesus is the Son of God and God at the same time? Exactly, Anna Marie, exactly. Okay, good. I'm glad I could help you understand that easy and anyone else. I hope you were able to understand that as well. Now, there are some people that, that don't believe that way. There are some people who believe that Jesus was just a man and uh, Jesus was the firstborn of creation and all this other jazz. If you don't believe that way, that's okay. But please take what I just told you and understand. So uh, what, what do you need clarification on, Seraphic? Now, if you run into a Christian brother or sister who doesn't believe the same way as you do, um, not, well, not sure about Jesus being God or uh, or God in general. Or send me a DM, Seraphic, so I can try to get to the root of your question so I can help, help guide you to where you need to get guided to. So if someone believes differently, don't ridicule them. Give them love anyhow. Um, accept their differences and the scripture we're getting ready to go through is going to talk about some of those differences here uh it, we might not get to it tonight we've already been going 44 minutes all right seraphic yeah send me send me a dm seraphic and uh with what exactly your question is that way i can help try to help get you on the right path to find the answers you seek okay but anyhow let's get into the the actual scripture so what i want you to do is open up your bibles to Acts chapter 10, and my Bible's on my phone here. That's Acts chapter 10 I just opened up to there. I am going to use the KJV. Now, contrary to what some people believe, the KJV is an excellent translation, but it's not perfect. Uh, there are instances where the KJV could have done a better job. Uh, for example, like in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill should have been translated as thou shalt not murder. Um... But there's little things like that. So there's no such thing as a perfect translation. Uh, and even some of the ancient texts, there are, there are transcription errors. So you have to be careful with those too. All right, so opening up the book of Acts, we're going to go through one verse at a time. We'll discuss verse by verse. Some of the verses, discussion will be boom, like that over. Other ones might take a while to discuss. All right, Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band. So what's the important thing going on here? Yeah, I don't know how many errors it has, Anna Marie, but it does have errors. But there's some Christians out there who think it's flawless, has zero errors. Um, so if, if you believe that way, that's fine. Believe that way. But don't get mad whenever I point out an error in it, please. So what do we have here? So we know that there was a man living in Caesarea, which we know that's in Italy. His name's Cornelius, and we know he was a centurion. What is a centurion? A centurion was a Roman soldier, like, like a captain. He, he led a hundred men. That's what a century is, it means a hundred. So a, a centurion was a leader of about a hundred men. And he was of, the, of a band called the Italian Band. So in other words, he's an Italian. And if you go into the original Greek, the Greek word means Italian. So this guy was a true Roman. He was from Italy. He was from Rome. He was a centurion in the Roman army. So this was a pure, absolute Roman right here. Verse 2. A devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. So he is a Roman. And the Romans were very polytheistic, basically worshiping the same gods that the Greeks did. Thank you, Dalton, for the... I didn't see what the gift is called, but that was cool. Oh, a forever rose. That was awesome. I don't think I've seen that before. Thank you, Dalton. God bless you. So he's a devout man of God, a Roman, living in the pagan Roman Empire. 
um, or the polytheistic, the, the term polytheistic would be better, the polytheistic Roman Empire, but he served the Jewish God. He was not a Jew, but he was devoted to the Jewish God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the, jo the God of Jacob. So that tells us right there, even in antiquity, there were people who were not Jewish that served the God of Abraham. What else? We have a model here of things that godly people do. He gave much alms to the people. What are alms? Alms are giving money to the poor. So, like you see me on my, on my morning lives, I might go around, uh, I see someone's hungry, I buy them food. That's giving alms. I buy shoes for someone that doesn't have shoes. That's giving alms. So alms is anything that helps giving to the poor, the needy, those who are in need. That's what alms are. Um, and then he said he prayed to God always. Prayer is highly important. You should be praying all the time. Uh, one of the scriptures says to pray without ceasing. God wants to have a relationship with us. How can you have a relationship with someone that you never talk to? Prayer is you talking to God. So we need to pray daily. Pray to God morning, night, in the middle of the day. Pray to God constantly. Because prayer is you talking with God, and God wants that relationship. Thank you for the crown there. That was, ooh, i never seen that before. Um, so make sure you pray every day. Alms to the poor, and pray every day. Those are two things God likes. What's the next thing? So next, verse 3. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him, and saying unto him, Cornelius. Thank you, Dalton, for the heart me. Uh, so, here, Cornelius has a vision. An angel comes to him. Now, it says in the ninth hour of the day, you have to go through an account for how the uh, Romans account for the hours to go. I think, I think the equivalent was like 6 a.m. So, ninth hour would be... Uh, 6 to 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. So the ninth hour probably be around 3 p.m. I have to go through and check and see if it starts around 6 a.m. or not. So around 3 p.m. in the day, an angel of the Lord came to Cornelius and gave him a message. Now as to why ninth hour, I don't know if there's any significance to it being the ninth hour, but 3 p.m. And he looked on him, and he was afraid, and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. So here, the angel is telling him, Because you pray all the time, and God has seen your charitable works. So alms can be translated as charitable works. Because of his charitable works to help those in need, and because of his prayers to God constantly, the Lord had listened to him. So if you're always going, Why aren't my prayers being answered? Well, are you praying consistently, or are you just, you know, uh-oh, I need something. Father God, help me with this right here, and then you never talk to God again. God's not going to hear you if you're not praying all the time. Now, that does not mean beg God all the time. God, I need this. God, I need this. It doesn't mean that, but because you constantly pray to God, you're more likely to be heard by God. And if you're helping, the, if you're being charitable, you're more likely to be heard by God. That's what that is teaching us right there. Thank you, Pink, for the roses. On to verse 5. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. So in other words, Simon Peter, the apostle Simon Peter, um, Joppa, was in Joppa, and Cornelius was told, send men to Simon Peter. So here's Cornelius, a Gentile, going to send people to Simon Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ, who was a Jew. Yes, he does, Melinda. God does give and God does taketh away. Next, verse 6. He lodged with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtst to do. Take note of this. In verse 5 we have Simon, and in verse 6, we have Simon, but they're two different people. So one thing like atheists like to do is like, oh, look at this person's name, and this person, and this. It's all the same person, but they're all doing three different things. Well, 
atheists that do that are using a, you know, being very illogical in that. Simon is a common name back then. And Simon is an, an, an angelicized version of the name. But it was a common name. Just like in Mary, in the Gospels, there's like four different Marys in the Gospels. So you got to know, are you talking about Mary, Mother of James, Mary, Mother of Jesus, uh, Mary Magdalene, or uh, Mary, the uh, sister of Lazarus? Which one of the four Marys are you talking about? <coughs> so in this case, we have two Simons. So that's why in uh, verse uh, verse 5, it says, one Simon whose surname is Peter. Make sure you go talk to Simon Peter, because there's a lot of Simons out there. You have to talk to this guy named Simon who's a tanner. We've got two different Simons. Verse uh, 7. And when the angel uh, which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that was waited on him continually. So we're just being told here in 7 um, that uh, Cornelius got his servants together, sent him out. One of, the sol one of the servants was a soldier. Verse 8. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. So in other words, he didn't send his servants off you know, just go get this guy. He told him, this is what I saw. He told him the vision he saw. He told his told him the conversation he had with the angel and then sent them off to go find Simon Peter. Verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up, uh, went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So again, we're looking at the sixth hour. That'd be 6 to 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So about 12 p.m., lunchtime so Peter went up onto the roof type Peter Simon or Simon Peter went up onto the roof type around 12 p.m. lunchtime he went to pray he hadn't had lunch yet keep this in mind Peter had not had lunch yet when he was up on the rooftop verse 10 and he became very hungry why did he become very hungry we just determined he had not had lunch yet and would have eaten but while they made ready he fell into a trance so in other words, he's up on the roof, he's hungry, and Jesus uh, basically he goes in tra into a trance, but that means his, his spirit was concentrating on something. So his, all his mental faculties were concentrated on a spiritual experience. Going into the next one, verse 11. And he saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him. And it had been a great sheet knit at four corners and let down to the earth. So in other words, what this? It's like a picnic table or a picnic basket, isn't it? So that this is this great sheet. It was basically like this sheet for a picnic has been laid out in front of him. He's hungry. He went to pray at lunchtime. Before he had lunch, he's starving right now. And God puts him into a vision. And in that vision, he lays down a picnic table in front of him. Twelve. Wherein where all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. So in other words, all these animals that are alive are on top of the picnic table. 13. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, eat. So in other words, this voice, which is the voice of Jesus, is telling Peter, You're hungry. Go kill something and go eat it. Then what does Peter say after that? But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So in other words, there's all sorts of animals that are unclean that God put before Peter on this thing. And God's telling Peter, Go kill it, go eat it, it's okay. And Peter's like, No, 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 you, you, the law of Moses says I'm forbidden to eat these things. Next thing, verse uh, 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten... Okay, we're already 14. 15, verse 15, sorry. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou call not, thou common. Now this is where a controversy comes in. It seems pretty clear there that Jesus is telling Peter, You can eat pig now. You can eat anything. That's like, you can eat shrimp now. You can eat pig. It don't matter. Everything's clean now. Everything is clean to eat. However, is that what this vision means? Does this vision actually mean I can eat whatever? Or is this vision about something else? Or does this vision have two meanings? Probably has two meanings, but we'll get into that. So let's go on to there. Thank you, uh, James, for the hearts. So verse 16. This was done thrice, and the vessel received up again into heaven. So 
Thrice means three. So in other words, Jesus laid out this spread before um, Peter. Peter saw all these animals on it. Jesus said, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter goes, no, 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 no. I, I can't eat anything I clean. And then Jesus repeats it again. Peter, go kill, go eat. And, and Simon goes, no. And then the third time, Jesus says, kill, go eat. And Peter's like, no, I can't. Thank you, uh, Patricia, for the heart me. This is Acts chapter 10. I'm now chapter 10, verse 16 is where we're at right now. Going on to verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had, had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made it... Uh, so, sorry, my tongue's messing up. Had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So the men sent from Cornelius had arrived by the time Peter wakes up from his vision. What is Peter thinking? Gentiles, Roman Gentiles, just showed up at his gate. And he just saw a vision about unclean foods. What is Peter concluding right from the beginning right there? Peter is concluding, Oh, I should receive these Gentiles as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because remember, the Jews go, we're better than the Gentiles. Now suddenly the Gentiles, I have to accept them as part of my brethren? So Peter initially is taking that vision to understand that this wasn't about food. This is about accepting Gentiles as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus with the Jews. That the division between Gentiles and Jews was removed, and now they're one. There is no more division in Christ. There is no Jew and Gentile anymore in Christ Jesus. There's just Christians in, in Christ Jesus now. Okay, on to verse 18. And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. So in other words, they're at the gate. They were asking if Simon Peter was there. Amen, Savitri. Uh, da, 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 da. While Peter thought, okay, this is 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said, to, said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. So in other words, the Holy Spirit is telling Peter, Your vision is related to these three guys uh, being at the gate. 20. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So now Peter's like, going, whoa, 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 whoa. Because remember, Peter is a, a very strong, devout Jew. And Peter's like, whoa, 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 I, I'm a Jew. Why are you sending these Gentiles to me? These Gentiles are unclean. I'm not, I'm not supposed to even associate with Gentiles. If I'm a good Jew, I don't associate with Gentiles. And Jesus is telling him, no, 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 Peter. You go associate with those Gentiles because I have sent them to you. I want you to preach the gospel to these Gentiles because I want these Gentiles in my kingdom. And Peter's like, oh, man, he's, he's probably, he's probably blood pressure probably rising over that because he didn't expect Jesus to say the Gentiles are part of our fold too. It isn't just the Jews anymore. Uh, da, 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 da. 21. <clears throat> then Peter went down to the men, which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek, that is the cause wherefore ye are come. You're welcome, Patricia. I'm glad you're enjoying. So in other words, Peter introduces himself. He submits to God's will. Despite, we all know Peter is, Peter, God had to send that vision to Peter because Peter was, he, he was like, no, I'm not going to associate with Gentiles. So Jesus had to convince him, no, you're going to associate with Gentiles. So he's introducing himself. He submitted to God's will. Peter didn't want to do it. He submitted to God's will because God said, no, Peter, you're going to do it. Peter goes, okay, God, I'm going to do what you told me to do. And he submitted to God's will, went down and introduced himself to the Gentiles. All right, what was that, 22? Yeah, we're on 22 now. And they said, Cornelius is the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God. And when they're saying there, these, they're making sure that Peter understands that they fear the God of Abraham. And of good report among all the nations of the Jews was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear these words. So here is further confirming 
Jesus told told uh, told Peter, these Gentiles I sent to you. The Gentiles are saying, God told Cornelius to send us to you. Hello, uh, Silcar, how you doing? Twenty three. Then God had called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. So in other words, these men that uh, Cornelius sent stayed the night with Simon Peter. Then in the morning, Simon Peter got up with them, and then they all headed back to uh, Caesarea, where Cornelius was at. Glad, glad you're enjoying it, Silcar. 24. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and he had called together his kinsmen and near friends. So Cornelius was so excited that the apostle of Jesus, one of the twelve, well, one of the eleven, because one of the twelve was no more, Judas Iscariot had passed away. Oh, what, uh, Matthias, uh, Matthias, I forget how to say his name. They did replace Judas already, so it's back to one of the twelve at this point in time, uh, because Judas... So they went from 12 to 11 because Judas went away. Then they elected a new one back up to 12. So Cornelius is excited to have one of the apostles of Jesus here. And Cornelius may not even have heard of Jesus at this point in time. He was just told by God, go get Simon Peter because I want to teach you what has transpired. So Cornelius may not even have known about Jesus yet. <clears throat> 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. This is where Cornelius messed up. Cornelius should not have bowed down and worshipped at Simon Peter's feet at all. Um, so that's a mistake Cornelius made. But Cornelius was so excited because he was about to hear this special message that God had sent for him to hear. Uh, but Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And that is true for any person in Christ Jesus. Everyone is just a man. If someone tries to say, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm greater than other people, that is a fruit that testifies that they are not a Christian. If they're a Christian, they're going to testify, I'm just a man like everyone else. Just like the angels. What do the angels of God say? If you try to worship at the foot of an angel, what do the angels always say? I'm just an angel. I'm just a servant like you are. Don't worship me. Worship God. That's what every angel will do. How do we? This is another thing about the testament of the divinity of Jesus Christ. People did fall at Jesus' feet and worship at Jesus' feet. Did Jesus ever rebuke them and say, Don't worship me, worship God only? Not once. Anytime anyone worshiped at Jesus' feet, Jesus accepted their worship. Angels always say, Don't worship me, worship God. Simon Peter here said, Don't worship me, worship God. Thank you, Pink, for the. Uh, the heart me? Exactly, T-Bone. Bow to no one but God. Alright, where are we at here? 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were, com that were come together. Okay? So, lots of people were going to hear the gospel of Christ that day. Not just Cornelius. A whole bunch of people were about to hear the gospel of Christ. 28. And he said unto them, Ye know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. So here's how we know Peter was having issues with going to this Gentile's house. This is why Jesus had to give him that vision. This is why Jesus has said, No, you go with these men and go to Cornelius. Because Peter, being a devout Jew, he here he is, he's telling the Gentile Cornelius and everyone with him, it's unlawful for me as a Jew to associate with you. He's telling them that right there. So this is how we know Simon Peter had issues with going to Cornelius to begin with. And why Jesus had to say, no, Peter, get that out of your mind. You're going to the Gentiles. So next, uh, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So he's explaining, even though it's unlawful for Jews to associate with Gentiles, God has told me you're now accepted by God I, I have to put the old ways of the Jews away and I have to become different than the Jews uh, next one therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for I asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me 
And Cornelius said, okay, so he's asking Cornelius, so Cornelius is answering him. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So now Cornelius is explaining to Peter what had happened. <clears throat> 31, and said Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. So he's explaining that even though I'm a Gentile Peter, even though I'm a Roman Peter, I still serve the God of Abraham, and your God, the God of Abraham, still heard me. I don't know who Jesus is, but I know who the God of Abraham is, and I worship the God of Abraham as a Gentile. I serve the God of Abraham as a Gentile, and your God heard me. That's a powerful statement, which indicates that even before Jesus came, God accepted Gentiles before Jesus came. He just treated him differently. And there's other things about that as too. Uh, like, for example, uh, Abraham went to Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a Gentile, high priest of God, high priest of the God of Abraham. A Gentile was a high priest of the God of Abraham. <coughs> My throat's starting to get dry because I've been talking a lot without break. Uh, but let's try to get through as much of this as we can. Uh, send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. We've already discussed this. It's mentioned higher up in the passage, so we'll just keep going. 33. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here, present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Okay, so now he's telling... God has a message for us. God wanted me to get you, Peter, to come here and tell us this message God wants us to hear. Yeah, I might need a water break, uh, Seraphic. We're, uh, I love Lucy, we're going through Acts chapter 10 and 11 and breaking down what it means and what's going on. And not just looking at, oh, here's just the dry words that say, we're, we're exploring what it means and, and, and so forth. Okay, where are we at? 30, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So in other words, Peter is kind of realizing that God is not concerned about the division between the Jews and the Gentiles. Peter is realizing this now. Peter is realizing that God doesn't care if you're a Jew or not. He doesn't care if you're a Gentile or not. He cares about... Do you desire a relationship with him? Peter's having an epiphany through this entire experience from the start of his vision up to the beginning, his confrontation, or not confrontation, his uh, encounter with Cornelius. Peter's having a big epiphany. And this is kind of what we're, what, learn, what we're learning right now is he, this epiphany that Peter is having. All right, uh, 30, 35. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteous is accepted with him. Here Peter's realizing, holy moly, this whole time God didn't just listen to the Jews. He listened to anyone everywhere that, that feared God. He didn't. Peter at the time probably, man, those people in India, if they feared Yahweh, God accepted them. Oh my, Chinese, if the Chinese had feared Yahweh, God accepted them. Peter's like, his mind's exploding because he, he just realized the Jews weren't the only people that mattered to God. Everyone mattered to God. The entire world mattered to God. The Jews were the chosen people of God, Anna Marie, for one purpose. At the very beginning in Genesis, we learn the first prophecy of the coming Christ occurs in Genesis. Jesus, or God says, I'll put enmity between you and the serpent, and you will strike you will crush his head, he will bite your heel. That biting of the heel is reference to the, the, the nails being driven through Jesus' uh, ankles um, or through his heel bone. And, it, and we have archaeological evidence of Roman crucifixions. And where do they drive the nail through? They drive it through the heel bone. So biting him in the heel in Genesis is in reference to that nail being driven through Jesus' heel bone at the crucifixion. So we've known since antiquity from the very beginning in the book of Genesis 
that Jesus was going to die on a cross. We knew that the execution on the cross was going to completely destroy all of Satan's plans. The Jews, the children of Abraham, the direct biological descendants of Abraham, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, are the chosen people for which the Messiah would enter the world. The person who, G who God said would be uh, bitten in the heel by Satan. And after all, who possesses Judas to set up the execution? Satan, the evil one. Samael possessed Judas to put Jesus onto the cross. Nailing him through the cross. Or through the heel. That was the serpent's bite right there. And then his resurrection from the dead crushed Satan on the head. That was predicted in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3. The whole game plan was spelled out in one verse in Genesis chapter 3 about Jesus dying on the cross at Calvary for us and defeating Satan and defeating death and allowing us to have reconciliation to God and have life everlasting in heaven with Jesus, with the Father, and with the Holy Spirit. That, that's awesome, easy. It may not be. It may not be. So anyhow, let's go on from there. So that the Jews were the chosen people for Jesus to enter the world for that to happen. As soon as the gate closed, so the gate was opened, Jesus entered the world, that gate no longer matters. Now Jesus is the new gate. So the Jews were the original gate for the Messiah to enter the world. Jesus is the new gate for everyone. Everyone. It don't matter who you are. Everyone can now enter into heaven through Jesus, who is now the gate for everyone to enter into heaven. So that's how the Jews were the chosen people. All right. Um, where were we at in our reading here? I think we're on 36 now. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. So now Peter's going to get into the gospel and explain the gospel to Jesus. Hi, Chaz. How you doing? Uh, and so he's saying he is Lord of all. In other words, Peter is now accepting that Jesus is the Savior of everyone, that the God of Abraham is the God of everyone. 37. That the word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. 38. How These need to go together. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and who went about doing good and healing, and all were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are the witness of all these things which he did before in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. So you see, basically, Jesus or Peter is going through the entire uh, what Christianity is. It's not called Christianity yet. It doesn't even have a name yet. It's still Judaism. They haven't even started calling themselves the way yet. So Peter's going through explaining the entire gospel message of Jesus Christ. And if you go to the Apostles' Creed, basically the Apostles' Creed is summing up everything Peter is saying right here. 40. And God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly. This is important here. The resurrection of Jesus was witnessed by massive amounts of people. Jesus was took 40 days after his resurrection. He spent 40 days on earth preaching, appearing to people all over the place. For 40 days, a lot of people witnessed the Jesus who was crucified pulled off, a lifeless body pulled off of that cross, a lifeless body put into a tomb. For 40 days, that lifeless body was alive, going around and showing people. And at the end of that 40 days, that body, that body that was dead and now alive, full of life, was then assumed into heaven. Witnesses all over Judea witnessed the risen Christ. And he commanded us to preach unto the people, we're on verse 42, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Now this is an important thing here. The word quick here doesn't mean fast. The word quick means life, living. So in other words, 
quick and the dead, that's fine for early modern English. To translate this verse into modern English, which is important for it to make sense, ordain God to be the judge of the living and the dead. So in other words, Jesus is going to be our judge. Jesus is going to be the one who judges us on Judgment Day. He will judge those who are alive on Judgment Day, and He will judge those who have died on Judgment Day. He will judge the saints, He will judge the sinners. So everyone is going to be judged by Jesus, that's what that's telling us. <clears throat> Jesus, I think I've seen that movie a long, long time ago, if it's the one I'm thinking about. Yes, they did, Anna Marie. They absolutely did. <clears throat> and I'm sorry I'm missing comments here. And questions. Uh, da, 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 da. 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remissions of sin. Now notice he's saying, given all the prophets witness. During, uh, thank you Dalton for the rose, during the 40 days that Jesus was on earth after his resurrection, Jesus was teaching the 12 apostles and disciples what all the scriptures meant. Jesus basically went down and said, hey, check out this thing here in Genesis. He will strike his heel and you will crush his head. Jesus went there and explained the apostles, here's what this means. Look at my heel. There's a nail hole right here in my heel. That biting my, biting my heel, that was the bite on my heel right there. He went through every single bit of the prophets, the law, and said there's a this prophet that this pointed to what you just witnessed. This was this. This was this. And so the apostles had full knowledge. Now why Jesus on earth they didn't have full knowledge. During that 40 days, Jesus taught them everything that was in the scriptures, saying this was this, this was this, this was this, this was this. So now you all know absolutely everything that is in these scriptures and how they pointed to me. So that's what Peter's saying right there when he said to give all the prophets witness. Jesus explained how everything in the Old Testament pointed to him and how he fulfilled everything in the Old Testament. Before, the apostles didn't know. But afterwards, after those 40 days with Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus taught them everything they needed to know. Thank you, Nancy, for the finger hearts. Uh, Alright, so 44. Oh, it's uh, before 44. 43, and receive remission of sins. So in other words, uh, Peter's saying that Jesus came for the remission of sins. His sacrifice on the cross for the remission of sins. 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. This is important. So all of these people in Cornelius' house, we don't know how many people were gathered, but they're, they're listening to Peter. They're, they're, they're being astonished. And the Holy Spirit enters into the hearts of the Gentiles. These Gentiles received the Holy Spirit like the disciples, the Jewish disciples did at Pentecost. Catch what comes next. 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now Peter had to have zero doubt at this point in time, because the same Holy Spirit he received at Pentecost, the Gentiles just received it right in front of his eyes. He saw the Holy Spirit enter into the hearts of Gentiles. Uh, Joshua, no, being gay is not a sin, uh, acting on it is. And I, whether you want to believe that or not, that's what the scriptures teach. Um, now, important thing, if you're a Christian, if someone is gay, you don't hate them. Don't hate anyone for the sin they do. God's forgiveness of sins fall upon anyone, including people who, I mean, if you're a thief, you fall under the same rights of forgiveness as anyone else. If you are an idolater, if you are um, a murderer, it doesn't matter what your sin is. Your sins can be forgiven. There's only very few unforgivable sins. Rejecting Christ is an unforgivable sin. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an unforgivable sin. Taking the mark of the beast is an unforgivable sin. But any other sin is forgivable. 
So you don't hate anybody, regardless of what the sin is. You don't hate anyone. You support somebody. I mean, Joshua, yes, being being that way is a sin. But at the same time, if I see you hungry, and you're uh, if you're of that orientation, I am not going to sit there and say, "Oh, well, you 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 do that weird thing." I'm not. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to clothe you. If someone's trying to beat you up, I'll step between you and the person trying to beat you up and defend you. I, you know, I mean, just because someone has that sin doesn't mean anything. Well, look at me. I have sins too. I've stolen in my past. At one point in time, I stole something. You know, I'm guilty of a sin there. I'm not going to hold your sins against you. I hope you don't hold my sins against me. In Christ, we forgive each other. So I hope that makes sense. Yes, murder is a sin. And it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God thinks. So if God says this, then it is what it is. I can't I can't sit there I can't sit there in good faith and say, "Well, God said this, but I'm going to just ignore what God said." And, Say what I want to say. I have to say what God said. That's correct, Insane Dieter. That's correct. All right, let's go on from there. So, they're all... Yes, we all sin every day. That's why we need to pray for forgiveness every single day. I don't know, what uh, Mama Duke. I thought the Bible, I, I... I don't know what you're trying to ask there. So, Peter's going, man... The, the, the Holy Spirit entered the hearts of Gentiles. So Peter's just totally blown away here. Uh, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. So this is how they saw it. So they started everything that happened at Pentecost. Peter saw the Gentiles doing. So that's how Peter knew. Dang, the Holy Spirit's in the in the hearts of the Gentiles too, because they started doing the same thing the apostles did and the disciples did at Pentecost. Uh. Gene, uh, Gene, yeah, there's three unforgivable sins. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. You can blaspheme the Son, you can blaspheme the Father, forgivable. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not forgivable. And blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to say, uh, this to say the Holy Spirit is unclean. Declaring the Holy Spirit to be evil. That is the unforgivable sin. Rejecting Jesus as Lord and Savior is an unforgivable sin. And, uh, Taking the mark of the beast revealed in Revelations is an unforgivable sin. In other words, uh, swearing loyalty to the to the to the evil one, basically the Antichrist. If you swear loyalty to the Antichrist, that's unforgivable. Good evening, Mo. Thank you for the heart. Me, how you doing? Uh, it, I do too, in Saint Dieter. And even back then, it was bad. There, here's here's a verse people don't quote very often. But uh, Jesus, uh, and I can't quote it directly off the top of my head, but the important part to quote is Jesus said he wished the world was already burning. Why would Jesus say he wished the world was already burning? Because the world was already painting Jesus. God didn't like the way the world was. He hated the sin of the world. He, he hated the evil in the world. Jesus wished that the world was already judged and done away with. But because of his grace... He allows it to continue. Jesus' grace, God's grace, is the whole reason we're still here today. He's giving us a chance, constantly giving us a chance to realize what good is to accept Jesus and to join Him. Jesus wishes the world was already judged and done away with right now, but His grace allows us to continue so that as many of us as possible can be reconciled to God before God's grace runs out. Alrighty. Where are we at? 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well? So at this point in time, Peter wanted to baptize all these Gentiles. Peter's like, oh my God, the Gentiles are part of this too. Peter's not, he's not at a point of like, oh my God, uh, like, I'm just flabbergasted. He's like, oh my God, this is wonderful. God's really, he's, he's actually celebratory now. He's wanting to baptize him with John's baptism now. So that's why he's asking for water. He wants to baptize these people. They, they've received the Holy Spirit. Now he wants to give them the baptism of John. 
Exactly, Patricia. That's exactly correct. Uh, Melinda, the digital money chip are not the marks of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast says that it will be a mark on the right hand. The digital money chip is not something on the right hand. Now, if they put a chip in your right hand, maybe. But it also says it's a mark on the forehead. But you don't have to have the mark on the hand or the mark on the forehead. You can know the name of the beast or the number of the beast. It's four things. So it's not just a mark on the hand, not just a mark on the forehead. It's also the uh, knowing the name or knowing the number of the beast. Ultimately, what it comes down to is it's serving the Antichrist. So if you serve the Antichrist, you have the mark of the beast. When the time comes for the Antichrist, Christians will not be allowed to buy and sell. You won't be able to enter into commerce. If you want to survive, you're going to have to learn how to grow food on your own. Okay, you're going to have to learn how to come up with your own stuff because if you don't serve the Antichrist, you will not be allowed to engage in any form of commerce. Many will take the mark of the beast. In other words, they will swear loyalty to the Antichrist because they'll want to buy and sell. They'll want to engage in commerce. They won't sit there and go, oh man, I'm going to have to go forage in the, in the woods for food. Um, they'll take the mark of the beast so they can go and buy and sell things. They want to be able to go to the grocery store. So the mark of the beast is basically swearing loyalty to the Antichrist. No, I do not think it's the vaccine. There are lots of churches in the in the uh, barn guy here. Yes, 666 is the number of the beast, and further goes on to say, and it is the number of a man, which means it's probably Hebrew numerology to disguise the name of the Antichrist, the name of the man. Um, we can do a, a study on the mark of the beast at one point in time. Uh, some There are hypotheses that say the mark of the beast, this stuff is already in the past. There are some saying it's still to come. But it's an interesting study. I wouldn't worry about it. Just realize this. If someone comes up acting like an antichrist, don't swear loyalty to them. If you don't swear loyalty to an antichrist, you have nothing to worry about. If you swear loyalty to an antichrist, well, you probably have something to worry about. You probably just took the mark of the beast. All right, let's go on here. But yeah, if you want to, uh, go on to my post where I talk about this Peter's vision here and just put on you, you want to learn about the mark of the beast and I'll schedule it into our studies. Yes, and St. Dieter will definitely be political. Good morning, Alicia in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, and like I said, uh, Gene, it, it depends. It depends on how you interpret uh, Revelation as to whether it's before or after. But I, I, we can do a special study on it if you want. Just let, let me know and I'll schedule into the, our Sunday studies here. Continuing on, uh, where are we at? 48, and this is the end of chapter 10. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So here we go. Peter baptized all these Gentiles in the name of Jesus. Now notice, uh, he said in the name of the Lord. When he's saying the name of the Lord, that means he baptized them in the name of Jesus. He didn't baptize the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. However, in other places they do baptize the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In this case, he just baptized them in the name of Jesus. That takes us now to chapter 11. Come on, where's my little... Ah, oh, there we go. Acts chapter 11, verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. The word spread quickly. Everyone had heard that the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit, got baptized, and everything like that. Sometimes resurrection, but you can also baptize the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as well, which is scriptural. It is in the Bible that they have done that before. And when Peter, so this is verse 2, and Peter was come up to Jerusalem, 
they were of the circumcision contended with him. So in other words, remember Peter said it's unlawful for me to associate with Gentiles. These are these are disciples of Jesus who were of the circumcision. Probably also uh, Jews of the circumcision all came up and going, Peter, you just violated the law. Why did you go associate with Gentiles? They were like, they were confronting him on it. No, it's not incorrect at all. We can pull up scriptures where you're baptized in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. In fact, we'll throw that under a Bible study and we'll throw that in there. Uh, da, 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 okay, verse 3. Saying, Thou wentest into the men uncircumcised and did eat, oh my, look at that, and didst eat with them. What do you think Cornelius prepared for a meal whenever Peter showed up? Let me know. Let me know in the comments. These are Romans, Gentile Romans. What was a big meal for the Romans? What do you think they prepared for their feasts? Wine was probably there, but what do you think was the main feast meal at a Roman feast? You nailed it, Jennifer. Pig. Pig, 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 pig. Exactly, T-Bone. Yeah, we're just trying to learn here. Pork, exactly. For so what do you think Peter had to eat that day? Peter probably ate pig that day. He probably ate pig for the first time in his life. Now we come back to that vision we saw. Why do you think Jesus had Peter see a vision three times of unclean animals and Jesus telling Peter get up and go eat. Peter get up, kill and eat. Unclean animals. We know it was also about accepting the Gentiles as no longer being unclean but as being clean. But if you're going to minister to the Gentiles and the Gentiles don't know your Jewish customs and they serve up food for you to eat and they serve unclean food and you have to sit down and eat that unclean food with them. So in other words, Peter's vision had two meanings. The first meaning was the Gentiles are now clean. You will associate with the Gentiles. The other meaning was you can now eat whatever you want. Because Peter, as we see right here in verse, uh, what was that verse three? Oh no, verse, yeah, verse three. He ate with them and more than likely they served unclean foods. And so in order to spread the message to the Gentiles, if I go into a village that's never heard of Jewish custom or Jewish law and they serve food up, first of all, I'd be roofing, oh, I can't eat what you're serving. How rude. No. Jesus was basically telling Peter, you're going to minister to the Gentiles, you're going to have to eat whatever they're eating. So now everything is clean. So Peter's vision had two meanings. Anything is allowed to be eaten, and the Gentiles are now clean and accepted as just like the Jews are. Thank you, Florida Gator, for the heart me. Thank you, Frida, for your uh, for your prayer there. Uh, thank you, Florida Gator. Oh, just said you became team member 453. I thought you'd already sent me a heart me before, Florida Gator. That's cool. No, very tough times back then. Yeah, bringing it all together now, T-Bone. Thank you, Resurrection, for the, for the roses. So this is what I wanted to get to is up to this point right here. So now we see, and basically we're just going to recap everything we just did in, in, in verse 10, or chapter 10. We've already been going for over an hour and a half right now. So the whole point of everything I wanted to cover today was that oftentimes messages in the Bible have dual meaning. You have two meanings to some things. You see this in prophecies as well. Sometimes prophecies have two, two fulfillments. You have an immediate fulfillment and a long-term fulfillment. Like sometimes some of the prophecies in the uh, Old Testament had an immediate fulfillment in the Jewish world and then a future fulfillment when Jesus came. So keep that in mind with everything. Whenever you read, sometimes things have more than one meaning in the scriptures. And I hope you saw that as we went through this. We saw that, yes, immediately we knew that that vision was telling Peter, the Gentiles are clean. And the people want to say, oh, well, we can't eat pork. Because that vision only meant that the Gentiles were clean. Don't read the rest of it and go to the man. Peter ate with them too. Peter ate unclean foods with the Gentiles. That vision also meant that the dietary restrictions of the law of Moses no longer apply to Christians. Including Jews who are in Christ. Now, 
if you as a Christian choose to follow the dietary guidelines that the Jews follow, that's fine. Just don't preach it and force others to do what you're doing. If you want to do that personally, that's fine. The other thing I warn you about, do not yoke yourself to the law of Moses. There are two laws. There's the law of God, which is like the Ten Commandments, and then there's the law of Moses. The law of Moses is just for the Jews. It's not for everybody. It's just for the Jews. Do not yoke yourself to the law of Moses. Because if you yoke yourself to the law of Moses, then you're yoking yourself to salvation through the law of Moses, not through Jesus. Don't yoke yourself to the law of Moses. Yoke yourself to Jesus. The other thing, um, excuse me, my throat is getting really, really dry there. Uh, the other thing you want to be aware of is that um, uh, if you do follow the dietary guidelines in the Law of Moses, just follow those for yourself, for your own personal benefit. But don't do it because the Law of Moses said to do it. Do it because you want to do it because, oh, I don't want to eat pork because it's not, it's not healthy for me or something like that. Don't yoke yourself to the law of Moses, please. Yoke yourself to Jesus Christ. Thank you, RA, for your comment there. And also, like I said, anything that we teach in here, anything we discover in the scriptures here, if it goes against what you believe, don't get angry about it. Just learn. Think about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. If you think what I'm saying the scriptures say is hogwash, don't get, don't get angry about what I'm saying. If you think I'm wrong about something, feel free to rebuke me. Feel free to come to me and say, I don't, I don't agree with what you're saying here. We can have a discussion about it. Um, maybe I'll go, wow, whoa, you're right. I never considered that before. It's possible. It's possible I may be saying something you don't agree with. You might sit there and think, about, darn, he was right. You know, I could be wrong, you could be right. I could be right, you could be wrong. It goes both ways. Don't get angry at any information given out on here. Don't get angry at any inf information anyone else gives out on here. Take everything that's said, think about it critically. That's why back in that prayer at the beginning here, the one, the prayer that I wrote, uh, asking for the Holy Spirit so that, so that our minds can deduce. We need to think about this stuff. Don't be blind in your faith. Be educated in your faith. Exactly, Melinda. Look at the word yourself. Pray for understanding. Thank you, Seraphic. I appreciate you, too. Glad to hear that, Jane. So, anyhow, this is where I was going to conclude the study. was up to that point where it's like, bam, Peter ate, with the, ate the unclean foods with the Gentiles, meaning that vision had a second meaning, which is in the idea that there are dual meanings to a lot of things in the Scriptures. There's dual meanings in prophecy. There's dual meanings and messages. Sometimes the message has an immediate impact, but then has a future impact later on. So Peter's vision meant Gentiles are now acceptable by God. Do not hate them because they're Gentiles, and you can associate with them because you're all my children. If you're in Christ, Gentile or Jew are all my children now. And you can eat whatever you want now. And even Jesus, Jesus hinted at this before Peter's vision. What did Jesus say to say to the people? He said, it's not what, what enters into a man's mouth that makes him unclean, it's what comes out of it. In other words, the BS you say with your tongue is what makes you unclean, not what you put into your mouth. Eating a pig does not make me unclean. And God knew that whenever he uh, instructed Moses to set up those dietary guidelines. The reason why the reason why God set up Moses with these dietary guidelines was the Jews had to be different than the Gentiles. The dietary laws were part of that making the Jews different than the Gentiles because the Jews were to be the gate through which the Messiah would enter the world. That was it. All those things that made the Jews different from the Gentiles went away. Whenever Christ died on the cross, God left the Holy of Holies. The curtain tore. And there was a voice heard saying, let us leave this place. Then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit entered the hearts of the believers. Then here, here when Peter's talking to Cornelius, the Holy Spirit entered the hearts of the Gentiles. 
And now the kingdom of God, the temple of God, is the body of believers, the church. So that's the whole important part of this message here and why I wanted to cover this on the first Bible study. This shows that Jesus died for everyone, for Gentiles, for Jews. All you got to do is to say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, enter my heart, and you're saved. And that's all there is to it. So anyhow, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and close up the Bible study here after that message there. Eating garbage and feeling like garbage has nothing to do with being clean or unclean. Yes, your tongue does have a lot of power. And I'm just going to mention this here. Um, knowing names is important. Knowing names is utterly important for God. He wants everyone to know his name. Now his name is usually uh, put down as YHWH um, for Yahweh. Um, but Jesus is an acceptable name. God has many names. Jesus is a name for God. Yeshua is a name for God, which is the Jewish pronunciation of, or sorry, the Aramaic pronunciation of Jesus, the name that everyone would have been saying when Jesus was walking around, Peter would have called him Yeshua, wouldn't have called him uh, Jesus. Um, it says in Revelation that when Jesus comes, he will come with a name that no one knows. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to give us another name to call him by. And knowing the true names of things is very, very important. Um, if you read the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch is not scripture, but it gives us the names of demons. Which, if you're ever going to need to confront a demon, if you know its name, you're going to be able to better command that demon to go away in Jesus' name than if you don't know its name. Look what happens when Jesus runs up to the, the, the man on the road where all the swine are at. What does Jesus ask? What's your name? And then the demon tells him, we are legion. If you command a demon knowing its name, you have better control over that demon in Jesus' name. You yourself don't have any control over it. But if you know its name, you can better command that demon to, to go away in the name of Jesus than if you don't know its name. This is why the KJV translating and saying that uh, the Satan's name is Lucifer is a huge disservice. Satan's name is not Lucifer. It's Samael. So if you ever run into Samael and you need to tell him to rebuke him in the name of Jesus and send him away in the name of Jesus, you need to know his name is Samael, not Lucifer. And that's something we can get into if we ever study the book, the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch teaches us this, this sort of stuff. It's not scripture, it's apocryphal. And even being apocryphal, it has merit. There is good information in it. Like knowing the names of the demons so that we can rebuke him in the name of Jesus. That's the good information in Enoch. But Enoch is not scripture. Exactly. Believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Oh, you're welcome. It's, it's me, Josh. So 9 p.m. Philippines time on Sundays is when we're doing this Bible study here. Yes, Anna Marie. Yahweh is the Jewish term. Jehovah came from the Greek transliteration of Yahweh. So the Greek transliteration of Yahweh in the, into the Septuagint is how we get the word Jehovah. And it would have been Yehovah. And then as the letter J came about, uh, it would have, would have moved, still been a Yehovah, but then the, Jew, the English pronunciation J has the J sound. It became Jehovah in English uh, through that route of movement. And then there's another thing that goes into that also as to how we got as to why Jehovah was translated from Yahweh. Because Yahweh is not written in the, in the Jewish scriptures. It's Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton. However, in the uh, scripture above the Y-H-W-H, they put in the, the vowels for Adonai. In other words, they were saying, instead of saying Yahweh when you read this, just say Adonai, which means Lord. That's why a lot of the Bibles don't put Jehovah in there. They put Lord in instead because... The original reading, the, the Hebrews would have said Adonai, wherever they saw Yahweh written at. And so when the Greeks transliterated, they took the vowels for Adonai and put them into the YHWH to get Yehovah, which eventually became Jehovah. Yes, Abba is uh, uh, 
Hebrew for uh, father. The only thing, Melinda, about reading Enoch, make sure you're good and strong in your uh, basic faith first. Enoch does say it's written for the last generation. In other words, Enoch was not written for, like, the apostles to read. Enoch was written for this generation to read. Okay, we're getting near the end times. Uh, most of the signs of Revelation are in place right now. Uh, it could still be another hundred years. It could be another thousand years before Christ comes. But the point is, we're in the end, end times now. Enoch, at the, in the preamble to Enoch, Enoch says, this is written to the end generation. Which is probably another reason why it never became scripture, because it wasn't written to the people of the past. It was written to this generation. We're the generation it was written for. But when you read Enoch, make sure you uh, make sure you're real grounded, because there are some things in Enoch that are not should just be rejected, uh, because Enoch's been altered a lot over time because it was never it was never protected as scripture. So Enoch is there's some weird stuff in Enoch. So you need to be careful while reading Enoch. Exactly, Anna Marie. And that also gets into Kabbalism, if you've ever heard of that. Kabbalism is Jewish mysticism. It's not something you want to study if you're a Christian. But even in Jewish Kabbalism, you need to know the true names of things to be able to cast your magic spells on them. You're welcome, T-Bone. Hello, A-Train. How you doing? You just missed my Bible study. We just did an hour and a half Bible study on Acts 10 through 11 verses, what we get to, 5? Or sorry, verses 3. So Acts chapter 11 up to 10 verse, or all of Acts chapter 10 up to 11 verse 3. Uh, a train's a, a pastor also, friend of mine in Arkansas. You too, Seraphic, God bless you too. Amen means so be it. Uh, tender heart, it's there's a people have to say it means Amun Ra and that you're praying to uh, some Egyptian. That's hogwash. It comes from a Hebrew word that's been translated transliterated into English. Amen or Amen means so be it or let it be so. Hello, Yvonne, how you doing? Uh, say which one again, Maurice? Kabbalism is that the one? Uh, yeah, Kabbalic teachings or Kabbalism. Kabbalah. Oh, about Enoch. Uh, so Enoch teaches us about the names of demons. It teaches us uh, about how heaven and hell is split into different layers and stuff like that. Um, the Apocalypse of St. Peter, uh, which we're going to read the Apocalypse of St. Peter. We're going to go through the Apocalypse of St. Peter on one of these studies here. Um, which is another important book Christians should read, but it sh you shouldn't treat it as scripture. But it teaches us some important things. Um, but you have to be careful reading Enoch because there's things in Enoch that are uh, not not kosher. And let me tell you an example of not kosher. So we learn about the Nephilim. Well, we learn that the Nephilim are tall. For example, Goliath was a Raphium. The Raphium were related to the Nephilim giants. The giants were not necessarily that as big as people would say. You, you read in like the Dead Sea Scrolls, Goliath was probably about six foot five or something like that. He wasn't very tall by today's standards. Now, if you've ever seen my wife next to me, my wife is about the size of the average Israelite during the time of King David. And we know how big they were from grave sites. We were able to look at the bones and see how big they were. My wife is about the size of the average Israelite back then. I'm just a little shorter than Goliath was, according to his... If you take uh, how many cubits and hand spans and stuff Goliath was, and you put those on the size of an average Israelite, and then you measure that out, Goliath was about, you know, just barely taller. Than me. He might have been this much above my head right here. There are basketball players today that are taller than Goliath was. The Nephilim were also giants. The Raphium were also giants. Goliath was of the Raphium type. Uh, knowing that the Nephilim were probably only, you know, as tall as a basketball player in the modern world here, 
Enoch says they were, you know, towered above the tallest trees, that the Nephilim were these huge, you know, like hundred foot tall giants. That's part of Enoch, you got to throw out the window because it, the scripture doesn't agree with Enoch there. Enoch disagrees with scripture, so we have to throw that part out, which is another reason why Enoch is apocryphal. Yeah, Melly, this is the this is the very first one we've done here. And I will take people's uh, suggestions to determine what the next Bible study will be. And also, I do pray that the Holy Spirit guides me through the Scriptures. So I'm praying that's not me just giving what I'm doing. It's me asking the host, please guide me through this. And sometimes I'm going through this and I go, man, I just learned something new myself as well. Because I'm asking the Holy Spirit to guide the, the what we're doing. Same word, Anna Marie, just third transliteration of it. Yeah, yeah, the Raphim and the Nephilim would all be uh, would all be basketball players today. Absolutely. You're welcome, Maurice. I do have a YouTube channel, but it's a mix of everything. Like my TikTok's a mix of everything I do, so is my YouTube channel. But if you go to TikTokon. Uh, YouTube channel, uh, or you can go to my uh, link tree, Sarah. If you get my bio, there's a link tree. Click on that, pulls up a link tree. Then just find my YouTube and link tree and go to it from there. So the Bible studies start uh, 9 a.m. every Sunday, Philippines time. Uh, also, my link tree. Uh, I mean, we could go through something in uh, Jeremiah, uh, Alyssa. Just uh, send me a DM or something like that, and. Uh, We'll schedule the next Bible study on something. We'll figure out what the next topic will be. Thank you, Nancy, for the finger hearts. Uh, so if you go to my, my link tree, there's a link, uh, sorry, a link time or time link. What is it? Time tree, that's what it's called. Time tree. It goes to a calendar, and you can see my scheduled lives on the calendar there. Oh, I'm sorry, Katie. Yeah, Alex, that's <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Melinda. I might, or maybe I'll download this Bible study here and post it to the YouTube. Uh, downloading my lives is data intensive, uh, but I might just do the Bible studies once a week, download those and post them to the YouTube. Because there's a lot of good information we put out today, so if I do that, that'll probably, probably work. Thank you, Maurice, again. All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and end the Bible study now, so let's go ahead and close it with prayer here. Um, so, Father God, I thank you for uh, the word that we excuse me. Thank you for the word that we explored today. I ask you to bless the reading of this word. I ask you to have the Holy Spirit teach everyone what the word means and help everyone to uh, meditate on your word daily. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.